So we'll make a start. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Cottleshaw. I'm the Head of Fundraising and Communications at the Bone Cancer Research Trust. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, who's hopefully at that side of me, uh, Dr. Zoe Davison, uh, um, Head of Research Information and Support. Um, but just to set the scene for everyone, if we have muted everyone, so uh, please remain that way. Obviously, the majority of people as well have got their videos off. Um, again, remain that way. I'll turn it on if you like. Um, if you do have any questions, because of the amount of people that are on, uh, we may struggle to deal with them live today. So by all means, if you have any afterwards, you can send them back to us. Or if you do have any burning ones, um, there may be some time at the end, but um, for now, if you can just hold back on those, that'd be great. But um, we will absolutely follow up on any questions you do have after the, the event if we can't get to them today. So um, stay on mute, keep your video off if you can, and uh, just hold back your questions for now. I, I will continue to admit people as they come in, Zoe, because I think there's quite a few people still joining. So um, I'll hand over to you to start. Okay. So here goes with the technology. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, thank you for joining us today. As Matt said, this is our largest ever webinar to date. We're quite overwhelmed by the amount of people that have joined. And uh, we're really, really grateful for, to you all for taking time out and joining us. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of kind of why we've done the webinars and a bit of background. So I thought I'd start off with a bit about our charity because I'm guessing some of you won't have heard of the Bone Cancer Research Trust. So who are we? Um, back in 2004, a group of families that had lost uh, children and young people to primary bone cancer were brought together by an oncologist called Ian Lewis, who was based in Leeds. He had seen the families all fundraising individually and actually thought that they might make a bigger impact if they came together. Um, they were all really frustrated by the lack of research that was going on in this area of cancer. And there was no information for families. There was no support for families going through a primary bone cancer diagnosis. And they all really, really wanted to change it for the next patients coming through. So in fact, some of them did come together. And in 2006, the Bone Cancer Research Trust was registered. So today we are the leading charity dedicated to primary bone cancer. Um, we offer hope to all of those affected by the disease. And our vision is a world where primary bone cancer is cured for all patients. Our mission is to save lives and improve outcomes for our patients across our four pillars of research, information, awareness and support. Um, we are a small, very small, um, there's currently 16 members of staff, um, so we're a small team, but we're incredibly dedicated and passionate about our cause and our patients. And unlike many charities, we're not based in London. Uh, we are based in a little town outside of Leeds called Horsforth. Um, so in 2017, we launched a new five-year strategy um, that's still undergoing, it's an underway now. And we set out a number of objectives and aims across our four pillars of work. And in awareness, what uh, we're here to talk about today, we said we will save more lives and increase survival rates through raising awareness of primary bone cancer amongst the public, healthcare professionals, researchers and policy makers. So we have started um, work on our awareness pillar. We have funded several awareness projects to date, uh, aiming at educating health professionals signs and symptoms of primary bone cancer which include an e-module for GPs, which is now actually archived and we're, we're reviewing the way we want to engage with GPs. And we run a sarcoma awareness module for medics in collaboration with an oncologist in Liverpool. With the help of our GP amb ambassador, who's gonna give a webinar, um, we have developed a symptoms video. And last year, as part of Bone Cancer Awareness Week, we reached over 4 million people worldwide 
and we're actually hoping that Bone Cancer Awareness Week 2020, we can surpass that number of people. So I thought I'd focus on why we're really here um, and it's our patients. So sorry. They, sorry to stop you. Are you on who we are? No. Is it not been going moving forward? Vicky, can you see who we are or has it moved on? No, it's on who we are. Oh. Oh. There we go. There you go. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. So um, a little bit about Harmony. So Harmony was eight years old when she developed this lump in her arm um, and pain in her arm. And she visited GPs. Um, she went to hospital, a local hospital to A&E and she had an appointment with a paediatric consultant at the hospital and was diagnosed by all of these professionals with an infection in her arm, even though there was no blood markers for infection. Um, and it was only when a family friend who was a paramedic looked at Harmony's arm and said, That's, there's something really wrong here, um, you need to take Harmony for an x-ray, that the real issue was highlighted. Um, after an x-ray, Harmony was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, um, an aggressive form of primary bone cancer. And this is Claire. Um, so Claire was experiencing pain and she'd been to her GP a number of times. Um, her GP referred her to a physiotherapist and actually a th physiotherapist was the one to highlight that there was something really sinister going on. Um, uh, physio sent her back to a GP and said you need to ask your GP for an urgent referral for imaging and after Claire had an MRI she was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. So why is awareness amongst healthcare professionals important? In 2015 we undertook a piece of stakeholder research um, which was called Living With and Beyond Primary Bone Cancer as part of this research, we interviewed patients, clinicians, researchers, and our supporters about the important aspects of a primary bone cancer diagnosis, treatment, and onward journey. And actually, it was this piece of research that gave us the first concrete bit of evidence that delayed diagnosis was a problem for our patients. And um, if you can see the quote at the bottom, um, I think this has been particularly haunting for the members of staff at our charity. So when I was finally diagnosed, I didn't know if I could go through the treatment. We had fought so long, I didn't know if I had any fight left in me. And it will probably horrify you that this came from a 14 year old patient. Um, no patient, let alone a child, should be left so exhausted battling to get a diagnosis that they've got no fight left in them and that's what we want to change. So last year we hosted five undergraduate medical students from the University of Sheffield as part of their social accountability module and they started reviewing all of our educational materials for healthcare professionals and as part of this placement they decided that they wanted to focus on um, education of medical students so undergraduate medical students receive very little training on sarcomas. In fact, they have about half an hour in total, and that covers both soft tissue and bone sarcomas. And so they decided they wanted to make an information resource, and they designed this flashcard, which is the size of a postcard and covers all of the important take-home messages for primary bone cancer, from risk factors right through to how it's managed and the general epidemiology of the disease. And it was that flashcard that really spurred us on um, to this awareness project that we're doing now. At the same time, we developed a, a really strong collaboration with Children with Cancer UK, which was formed at the end of 2018, going into 2019, where we hosted an a U, a osteosarcoma symposium together. And both charities really did have um, a key priority being early diagnosis. So together we launched the Bone Cancer Awareness Initiative, which is a 100 day project that started in July and is now culminating in this week. 
As part of this project, we did a patient survey. We wanted to understand how bad the problem really was. Um, it was done through SurveyMonkey and promoted via social media and through our support service. It had two main areas of focus, um, time and route to diagnosis and the symptoms experienced. Because while we were quite confident that we understood the symptoms that patients had if they had extremity primary bone cancer, patients can get primary bone cancer in any bone of the body. And we, don't, we didn't really feel like we had a handle on what those symptoms were if patients had one in the head or in the spine. We received 739 responses, um, some from the UK, some from outside of the UK, and one from someone who didn't say where they were. And we examined the results and subjected them to statistical analysis. So I'm just going to whiz through some of the key findings. Um, we, the answers were completed by current patients, former patients, and then um, by family members of patients. We had responses from in and outside the UK, and we had responses from patients that were both uh, female and male. There's no surprise to the um, kind of age uh, distribution. So we had a peak in child to, and young adult patients. And um, luckily, the year of diagnosis was um, mostly up towards the last kind of five or six years meaning that our results were true and current. So where did patients report symptoms first? Overwhelmingly, they went to a GP first, um, but 11% went straight to A&E and 3% went straight to a physio. The outcomes of this initial visit, 59% um, of patients weren't referred straight away. So 21 were asked to return if symptoms per persisted yet we don't know whether they had an adequate safety net in and 38% were dismissed altogether. And if you see in the blue on this graph, very, very few had a possibility of a primary bone cancer discussed at this initial visit. When we look at how many times patients went to healthcare professionals, um, we were quite surprised that quite a lot up to 20% went had to visit a GP four times or more, um, between four and six times. And actually the average number of visits to a healthcare professional was eight, which is very, very high. And it on average, it took six months for our patients to be diagnosed. So what's relevant to physios? So 20, almost a quarter, 24% of the UK patients went to a physiotherapist to report symptoms and half of these visited four or more times and often our patients are misdiagnosed. Um, we found 43% of our children were given growing pains as, as an alternative diagnosis uh, which was almost double um, that of patients outside of the UK. Um, so that's why we're here um, to raise the profile of signs and symptoms of primary bone cancer. So I'm now going to hand over to Garant, who is going to um, discuss his role as a specialist physiotherapist. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen now. Can you see that slide? Yep. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. My name is Garrett Davis, and I'm a Macmillan Specialist Practitioner or Physiotherapist working at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt Hospital in Oswestry in Shropshire. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Bone Cancer Research Trust for inviting me to talk today about recognising primary bone cancer symptoms and understanding the referral pathways during, the, during this uh, Bone Cancer Awareness Week. The aims of uh, today's session is to increase your awareness on the symptoms of primary bone tumours, understand the referral process for a potential bone tumour, understand the diagnostic process, 
and understand their treatments and management. Just a little bit about me first. So I've been a practicing physiotherapist for 14 years, qualified in 2006. Like the majority of physios, I developed my core skills as a rotational band five and band six before deciding to specialize. Whilst in a static orthopedic role, I had the opportunity to further develop my career and took up a post as a Macmillan Specialist Orthopaedic Oncology Physiotherapist at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt's Orthopaedic Hospital in Oswestry. We are one of five centres in England to provide diagnostic treatment and rehabilitation service for bone sarcomas. We also diagnose and treat soft tissue sarcomas, bone metastases, benign bone tumours and tumour-like conditions. The service for bone tumours is commissioned by NHS England and with the Manchester Royal Infirmary, the Christie Centre Manchester, we make up the Greater Manchester and Oswestry Os Sarcoma Service. I became a Macmillan Specialist Practitioner when my role was extended to include both physiotherapists and key worker duties. I'm the lead orthopaedic oncology physio for the Trust and I provide a weekly physiotherapy-led surveillance clinic for patients following endoprosthetic replacements from six weeks post-op for all bone sarcomas giant cell tumour of bone and selected patients with metastatic disease. I assess new patients with a soft tissue swelling and with a same day ultrasound scan and I support patients and their families throughout their pathway and diagnosis of treatment. Prior to commencing within the service I had limited knowledge of primary bone tumours and how to identify a possible concern so I hope today's session can create an awareness of these symptoms of a primary bone tumour and the process of referral, diagnosis, treatment and management. So what is a bone tumour? So this is the name given to a type of tumour that arises in a cell found in the bone. These tumours can be categorised as benign or malignant. Malignant can be further broken down into primary, so this is a tumour originating in the bone, or secondary, a tumour cell spread from somewhere else such as the breast or prostate. Today's talk will mostly focus on malignant primary bone tumours. Primary bone tumours are also known as bone sarcomas, and these are rare and potentially aggressive malignant tumours of supportive or non-connective or other non-epithelial tissue, such as muscle, bone, tendons, blood vessels, and fatty tissues, also known as orthopaedic tissues. We just have a look at the demographics now. So primary bone tumours are very rare and account for about 0.2% of all cancers diagnosed in the UK. In 2017, there were reported 560 cases of primary bone cancers in the UK, and a GP may only see one of these uh, cases in their whole career. Although primary bone tumours are common to our service, we only see roughly 50 confirmed cases per year. They affect people from all uh, age groups, from children up to the elderly, with specific bone tumours more prevalent in, in certain age groups. Males are slightly higher risk than females of developing most types of uh, bone tumours. And they can develop in any bone in the body, but 34% of cases are found in the long bones of the lower limbs. There are many risk factors that can increase the risk of a primary bone tumour, but the majority of causes can be put down to very bad luck. Previous radiotherapy for treatment of previous other types of tumours can lead to radiotherapy-induced sarcoma, seen sometimes in those with previous prostate or breast cancers, for example. If a patient has a previous uh, uh, primary bone cancer, they'll be more at risk of a recurrence or metastatic deposit. Due to the amount of treatment involved and the impact on the immune system, patients who've had a childhood cancer are at higher risk of developing a primary bone tumour. Genetics play a role in increasing risk, as seen in conditions such as leaf and eye syndrome. And the presence of certain conditions such as Paget's disease, osteochondromas and enchondromas will also increase the risk. The most common primary bone tumour diagnosed in children and young adults is an osteosarcoma, which is of osteogenic nature and has a peak distribution in adolescence and in the seventh decade. These are typically uh, metaphyseal or metadiaphyseal lesions, and the most common sites are in the hips, knees, and shoulders. The chondrosarcoma is of chondrogenic nature and is the most pr common primary bone tumour in adulthood. It presents in adults from the age of 30 to 80 and peaks between the fourth and sixth decade. 
These are typically seen in patients who are likely to de develop osteoarthritis. It's imperative to ensure that the symptom symptoms fit with that diagnosis if you're treating them in a physiotherapy clinic. If the symptoms do not, it's recommended to organize an x-ray. They are typically seen in the metaphysis and common sites or in the proximal femur, pelvis, proximal humerus, proximal tibia and scapula. A Ewing sarcoma is the second most commonly diagnosed form of primary bone cancer in children and young adults with 70% of cases of Ewing sarcoma affecting people under the age of 30. It is of unknown etiology and are always high grade and aggressive. Survival rates is poor and roughly about 50% at five years and there have been minimal changes in this rate in the last 30 years despite research and advances in, the, in medicine. Common sites for tumours are in the long bones and flat bones. Another rare primary bone tumour is a chordoma, which affects about one in 800,000 people and presents with varying symptoms, meaning diagnosis can be difficult and lengthy. These tumours are low grade, therefore slow growing. They're unlikely to spread, but can be locally aggressive and cause bone destruction in neighbouring bones. They can affect people of all age ranges, but mostly found in those in their 40s and 50s. 50% 50 of tumours are found in the sacrococcygeal area and 15% in the rest of the vertebral column. The rest are found in the skull. Within our service, we're also commissioned to diagnose and treat giant cell tumour of the bone. This is a benign but active aggressive tumour that acts like a malignant tumour and can transform into a, malig um, into a malignancy. They make up 4 to 5% of all primary bone tumours and usually affect patients who have reached skeletal maturity, generally between the ages of 20 and 45 years old. They arise in the metaphysis and extend into the epiphysis and most commonly found in the knee, shoulder and wrist. Signs and symptoms of primary bone tumours can often be mistaken, sometimes understandably, for symptoms of more common conditions such as growing pains and Oscar Slath disease in the immature skeleton and osteoarthritis in adulthood. This often leads to multiple visits to a GP or an onward referral to a physiotherapist, which can then lead to a late diagnosis. There are also occasions where patients are treated for conditions that are not seen in that age group, such as a frozen shoulder in a teenager. The average duration of symptoms is three to six months prior to presentation, but can be longer, with 26% of patients waiting seven months to receive a diagnosis. Symptoms to be aware of are bone pain, particularly occurring at night. This is a red flag symptom. Be especially vigilant in the young adolescent patients and can often be mistaken as growing pains. Growing pains tend to be only present at night. The primary bone tumour pain will present with localised pain also throughout the day. It can present as non-mechanical, constant or intermittent pain that can be resistant to analgesia. As the tumour grows, the intensity may increase. Other red flag symptoms to look out for are a palpable or visible swelling or mass and a pathological fracture, although this is uncommon. Other symptoms may include restricted movement in a joint due to the presence of a tumour, altered gait pattern due to pain, inhibitory factors and factors involving joint movements. Primary bone tumours can metastasize to other parts of the body and the most likely destination is the lung. A patient presenting with systemic symptoms such as tiredness, sweats and weight loss could indicate metastatic disease. If you're working in an outpatient setting, you may recognise symptoms from the initial assessments or you may have a patient whose symptoms that are not improving despite physiotherapy and pharmacological intervention. If you're suspicious of a primary bone tumour and this may present as a gut feeling, it's paramount to have this investigated further. All patients um, with a suspected primary bone tumour should be referred urgently to one of the five specialist bone tumour centres. They are in Oswestry in Shropshire, Birmingham, Stanmore, London, Newcastle and Oxford. It will depend on what physiotherapy role you are in as to whether you can refer directly into a bone tumour service. If you're in an advanced role and seeing patients in place of a doctor, such as an extended scope practitioner or working in a clinical musculoskeletal assessment and treatment service, then you can refer directly. 
If you're working in general outpatient role, please refer the patient back urgently to the initial referrer, whether this is a GP or consultants with your concerns and request an OMRA referral for imaging and potentially an OMRA referral to a bone tumor service. If you're early in your career and not sure about your findings, please discuss these with your senior physiotherapist or mentor. And I'd recommend directly speaking to the referring GP or members of the referring consultants team with your findings, along with a covering letter to ensure there's no delay in the referral process. We'll just take a look at the diagnosis uh, process now. So a plain film x-ray is the first line of investigation. This is often completed prior to referral at the patient's local hospital and will be used in conjunction with clinical symptoms. Observations on a plain x-ray could include bone destruction, new bone, bone formation, periosteal swelling, or a soft tissue swelling. But please note that a normal x-ray does not rule out a bone tumor. An MRI and CT may have also been completed prior to referral. Uh, if, the patient, if it hasn't, the patient will be invited to clinic for imaging on the same day. A CT chest and an isotope bone scan will highlight any other potential sites for concern in the body. And blood samples are taken to monitor full blood counts, ESR, bone profile, and myeloma screen is if, if this is suspected or to eliminate potential differential diagnosis. There's an MDT approach to the diagnosis and treatment of primary bone tumors and each patient is discussed at a weekly diagnostic MDT. This meeting includes consultant orthopedic oncology surgeons, consultant MSK radiologists, a pathologist and clinical nurse specialist. A bone biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis and histology results is used in correlation with the images. This is performed in a specialist center under CT guidance by the radiologist or in theater under X-ray guidance. Primary bone tumors are treated by excisional surgery and oncological intervention if indicated. The aim of surgery is to completely remove the tumor with a wide margin. A wide margin is the tumor tissue, tissue beyond the reactive zone in normal tissue. This can be completed by excision only, excision with an endoprosthetic replacement, and excision uh, with a bone graft. Unfortunately, at times, an amputation may be the only option. Excision-only surgery can be completed in expendable bones, such as the fibula. Excision and endoprosthetic replacement involves excision of the distal, proximal, or whole long bone, along with the tumor, and replaced with a metal replacement. Patients can achieve good functional levels following endoprosthesis and achieve optimum function 12 to 18 months following surgery. They are seen regularly by the tumor therapy team, including inpatient rehabilitation, com completed for one week at a time, initially six to eight weeks following surgery to complete exercises in a hydrotherapy pool and gym. In some specialist centers, excision of the tumor can be completed and a bone graft put in its place in the form of an autograft graft such as a fibula to replace the excised bone for a tumor in the radius, irradiated autograft, the excised bone is irradiated and replaced, or an allograft, a donor from another person. As stated above, bone tumors can lead to amputation, in particular if the tumor is impacting on or surgery will impact on the neurovascular supply to the limb, or if reconstruction is not achievable, such as in the foot of distal tibia. Patients can achieve excellent outcomes following amputations. The location of the tumor will determine the level of amputation to ensure a wide margin is achieved. For example, a tumor in the foot or ankle will result in a below knee amputation, but a tumor in the proximal tibia will result in an above knee amputation. Following post-op surgical discharge, their rehabilitation is continued at their local limb fitting center. Depending on diagnosis and grade, patients may require radiotherapy or chemotherapy prior to surgery or after surgery or both, uh, such as those with Ewing sarcoma. Surgical intervention is the only treatment for a chondrosarcoma as it does not respond to radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Here are a few examples of surgery following excision of a primary bone tumor. So from left to right, we have a proximal femoral replacement. Here we have a distal femoral replacement. In the middle is a proximal tibial replacement. Onwards to a 
proximal human replacements. And on the far right is a below knee amputation. Following diagnosis and treatment, patients are reviewed at regular intervals back in the specialist center for tumor surveillance and assessments of ongoing well-being and functional needs. They are seen every three months in the first two years, every six months from year two to five, and annually from five years onwards. Each, X each patient has an X-ray of the prosthesis or bone and a chest X-ray to monitor for tumor recurrence or chest metastases respectively. Any patient presenting with new symptoms is investigated. Symptoms of recurrence will present like those of an initial primary bone tumor. So this is something to be aware of if you are treating a patient with a history of a primary bone tumor in a general outpatient physio setting. Due to COVID-19, we have changed the way we follow up patients to include surveillance and rehabilitation via telephone and through the use of video technology. I'll now give you a couple of case study examples of the type of patients that present to a bone tumor service. This one is of a 19 year old female. She had an eight week history of an insidious onset of left shoulder pain and restricted movement. By the time of the referral, there was minimal movement in the shoulder. And please note, any tumor around the shoulder will present with a reduced range of movement. She was seen and assessed by her GP and she was diagnosed with a frozen shoulder and referred for physiotherapy which she reported helped a little. Whilst on holiday due to deteriorating symptoms, she had an X-ray and blood test and she was asked to organize an, an MRI on her return home. The MRI demonstrated abnormal mass in the proximal humerus. She was immediately referred to the regional bone tumor service by the, an upper limb consultant. A further plain film X-ray was completed along with a CT humerus confirming a diffuse permeative abnormality in the proximal humerus and sur surrounding soft tissue mass. A CT chest and a whole body MRI were completed for distant staging and this was identified as a solitary lesion. A CT guided biopsy was completed and subsequently she was diagnosed with a high grade osteosarcoma. Treatment consisted of pre-op ke uh, chemotherapy, a left proximal humeral replacement and further post-op chemotherapy. Some key points to take from this case study are as restricted movements and pain in the, shoulder, in the shoulder from an insidious cause should be a red flag as a frozen shoulder in, in a 19 year old is unlikely. This next case study is of an 18 year old, very active male who plays sport to a high level. He had a 10 month history of right lateral thigh pain. This was sometimes burning in nature but most of the time sharp and shooting down the leg. This was managed somewhat by cocodamol and ibuprofen. He was regularly having physiotherapy. Initial, initial thoughts were this was an iliotibial band syndrome, which would, you know, suppose be common in a condition in sports people, or could have been symptoms referring from the lumbar spine. Further investigations were completed through an MRI spine and bilateral hips with no reason for his symptoms identified. His pain gradually worsened and presented as a deep pain in the thigh that analgesia would not affect. He self-presented to a private physio who suggested due to the longevity and deterioration of symptoms, an MRI scan of the femur prior to commencing any further treatment would be beneficial. Unfortunately, the MRI demonstrates an aggressive bone tumor and soft tissue swelling in the femoral diaphysis. This lesion was below any previous investigations he had already had and therefore was not picked up. He was immediately referred to the regional bone tumor center. A plain film x-ray was completed and demonstrated a mid diaphyseal periosteal reaction in the right femur. There was an onion skin effect visible, which is commonly seen in urine sarcoma. Therefore, this was concerning for a malignancy. Although diagnosis was not confirmed at this stage, symptoms were highly suggestive of a primary bone tumor. Distant staging was completed through a CT chest and a full body isotope scan to check for any other tumor sites. And thankfully this was a solitary lesion. A biopsy of the femoral lesion was completed in theater under image guidance. And the patient was later diagnosed with a Ewing sarcoma. 
As discussed earlier, this is a highly aggressive type of primary bone tumor and is treated aggressively. They receive six months of preoperative chemotherapy before having the tumor surgically excised and replaced with a diaphyseal replacement. This is followed by six further months of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Some key points to take from this case study as he had a progressive pain that developed to a deep pain that analgesia was not helping and symptoms got progressively worse despite MRI imaging and ongoing treatment. Uh, this patient is actually a few years down the line now and I actually spoke to him this week and he's doing extremely well. So in summary for today's talk, be thorough in your assessments and be vigilant of red flag symptoms, especially in a young adolescent. Correlate symptom severity and length and assessment findings to the patient age and history. If you have a gut feeling about a possible primary bone tumor, follow it. The sooner a concern is investigated, the sooner it can be treated if it is a primary bone tumor. Discuss your concerns with a senior physio or a medic, whether this is a GP or a member of the consultant's team and discuss organizing some imaging if images have not been done already. Suspected malignant primary bone tumors should be referred to a specialist bone tumor service for further investigation. So make yourself familiar with your most local regional service. Patients are at risk of recurrence or metastatic disease. So if you suspect any of these, please inform the patient specialist center immediately. Here are a few references for further read reading if you want more information following this talk today. And please make use of the resources provided by the British Bone Cancer Research Trust. Many thanks for listening. I'll now hand you over back to Zoe. Thanks very much, Garrett. That was a really good overview um, of the signs and symptoms that physios um, need to look out for. Um, so I'm just going to finish off now with what resources we have developed uh, for healthcare professionals to help. Um, so these can all be found on our website um, in the awareness section. So the original flashcard that was developed by the medical students, we have adapted um, so we have designed one especially for physiotherapists. So it focuses on the clinical presentations, the investigations needed, the radiological features and the risk factors. It also tells you what you need to do if you suspect a primary bone cancer and the referral pathways. And it gives you our awareness um, website address where you will find all of the bone tumour centres that Garant mentioned. Um, so if you're not sure of which one your local one is or how you get in touch, you can find all the details on there. We have also developed a number of posters. Um, so the first one is um, an anatomical poster which covers all of the symptoms that we got out of our patient survey and these are broken down into the um, anatomical regions that the primary bone cancers affect. It also lists the common misdiagnoses that we found in these anatomical sites. We have a radiological poster which gives um, information on what to do about imaging and we have a poster that covers the signs and symptoms, the main ones, and really emphasizes the fact that it's important that you consider all symptoms together. Um, we understand that the symptoms of primary bone cancers are vague and can be mistaken for more common, less severe diseases. Um, but we found if, if they're taken in all together, um, so the local symptoms and, and the systemic symptoms, it will really help to make more timely diagnosis. So ways that you can get involved, physio bones. So please, please do use our resources. Um, be an ambassador and, and, and spread the word to colleagues that couldn't attend today. Um, host educational workshops internally using these resources and uh, this webinar, which we will send when we've uploaded it. Um, 
please feel free to attend our bone cancer conference. We usually hold this every year and it's a free to attend event for bone cancer patients. And it really, really is a heartwarming, emotional day. Um, we, uh, the charity would be happy to come to any national conferences, to any of your local events to pr present and provide any learning resources uh, we have. And please do feel free to participate in any of our challenges. We really do appreciate any support or anything you can do. So I'm just going to end giving an overview of our daily inspiration and thank you for your attention. Um, if you can give any feedback on the resources that you, if you start using them or if they help you in identifying any cases, please, please do let us know. Um, we would love to hear from you. I'm going to hand back over to Matt for some concluding remarks. Hi everyone, uh, so I'll just wait for Zoe's screen to stop sharing. So thank you to everyone who has uh, attended. We really hope you've got a lot out of this session. It's the first one we've ever done. So just to echo what Zoe said, you know, please do share what you've learned today with, with colleagues and, and, and your peers. Um, all the information that you've been shown um, will be made available after this webinar. So we will send a link to everybody who registered to a video upload of today's session um, and all the uh, free downloadable resources are available right now on our website at bcrt.org.uk slash awareness. Um, I'm just thinking on time, there are a couple of questions that have come in that, that seem to be a couple of themes and I just thought we might want to touch on those. Um, Garant, if, you want, if you're happy. Yeah, to that's fine. So one of the questions that um, Make a Difference Clinic has asked, how do you refer sensitively without stressing the patient? How would you approach that? Uh, like you said, I think, you know, it, it is about doing it sensitively and um, it's about making the patients aware that you are concerned about potential symptoms without kind of raising too much anxiety in them. Because like Zoe touched on then, the majority of uh, things could be of a benign nature, it could not even be a, any bone tumour. So it's, it's gently making them aware that you are concerned about these potential symptoms and it's better to get these things investigated rather than leaving it. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question from Joe Gilsham. Sorry Joe, I hope that's how you pronounce your surname. Um, regarding the red flag symptoms, is weight loss common in children? Not that I've seen, no. But then we, we don't, in our centre here, we don't tend to see many, many children. Uh, we do see some, but I wouldn't say weight loss is common. Thank you. And um, Helen Brown asked a geographical question. So is there a specialist centre in Scotland? I believe there are centres in Edinburgh and Glasgow, I believe. But I would need to double check on those. There's three centres in Scotland, um, so that those details are on our website as well. So um, the Irish centres are on there as well. Um, there's also another comment that's come in from Elizabeth. Um, you have asked whether we will offer certificates of attendance. Yes, we will. We'll send a digital certificate out to everyone who has attended today's session. Um, and I think that's pretty much all. The there's there's another one to make, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Go on, Zoe. I can't quite spot it. Do you mind sharing it? Is nerve pain, referred pain from the hip down the leg a potential symptom? It could be a symptom, but then that could be a symptom for many other things as well. So that would be need to be used in correlation with, with other findings. Okay. Um, and there's just one more, actually, another point. Just saying, could you just reinforce the differences between growing pains and primary bone cancer? So growing pains tend to only affect those uh, people at night time. So it's something they tend to experience uh, kind of when they're, when they're resting or when they're in bed. Uh, primary bone type pain does tend to be kind of visible throughout the whole 24 hour period, whether this is presenting as constant pain or intermittent pain. Excellent, thank you. And um, sorry, do you know the specialist centers in uh, Republic of Ireland, that's Aisling? 
Um, I'm not sure whether they're on the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland is, um, but we can have a look and, and, and put those on if that would be helpful. Brilliant. Okay, so I think um, we'll leave it there for today. But if you do have any other burning questions, anyone af or after the session, you think of anything, send them to us on the email that you got the invitation from and we will uh, be delighted to get back to you and give you that guidance. If you ever want any more um, materials sending to you as well for your practices, etc., uh, please request that from us. We will be delighted to send that out to you, the posters that you've seen. Um, if you want physical copies, we will send them. We have distributed um, a thousand to re registered mes uh, musculoskeletal physiotherapists uh, that will be arriving this week. But uh, if you don't get one and you want any of those packs or materials sending in the post put up, just ask us and we'll be delighted to send it. So thank you ever so much everyone for attending. Grant, thank you ever so much for your um, informative presentation and for your time. Um, thank you very much for asking. This week is Bone Cancer Awareness Week. So um, thank you ever so much for taking part and showing your support. We'll leave it there. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank everyone. you very much. Bye.